Welcome to this presentation of the Paper Street Podcast. You are late to the party, a program on the Paper Street Pictures Podcast Network. And your hosts for the following are yours truly. My name is Sean Talley. Joining me to talk, as he normally does with me, a fellow member of the Paper Street Pictures production team. He is Mr. Cameron Burns. Cameron, how are you? Uh, I'm a little sick, but I'm hanging in there and I'm making it through. So if I sound uh, a little sexier and raspier than normal, I haven't gotten any sexier or raspier. It's just this, uh, this cold. Well, you know what? I think it's even better to tell people the premise of this show in your sexy, raspy version voice. Well, thank you. That's why I'm here. Yeah. So basically, if you haven't listened to us before, uh, the whole concept of this show is we reach out to someone uh, that we love, someone that we want to have on the podcast and have a fun discussion with. We ask them kind of what's their biggest blind spot? What's their most popular, biggest, zeitgeisty movie that they haven't seen? And then uh, we bring them on, we chat with them a little bit about it, and then we send them on their merry way, have them uh, watch the movie, and then we come back and have a big old discussion about the movie. And uh, what makes it great is that no matter who you are, no matter how many movies you've seen, everyone has blind spots. So it's fun to uh, hear what other people's blind spots are, to talk to them after watching it, and also just for us to be able to uh, watch stuff again for the first time in a long time. So that's kind of what we do here if you're new. If you're not new, you already knew that and probably just fast forward it. Uh, We're going to talk with, you already know this because of the uh, title of the episode, but we are going to chat with a friend, Emily Higgins, about 1999's The Mummy. So stay tuned on the other side where we ask her, why has she not seen this movie yet? Joining us for this episode is a filmmaker who's directed features including Coin Heist and My Sucky Teen Romance, as well as a director of the cold open segment of Paper Street's own horror comedy anthology Scare Package and the writer-director of horror comedy feature, Sorry About the Demon, out now on Shudder and DVD. She is officially the first ever human being who can say that she has been a guest on both Paper Street branded podcasts. She knows more about teen drama series Dawson's Creek than you. I have to throw that in as well. She is Emily Higgins. Emily, thank you so much for joining us here. Thanks for having me. Excited. Yeah, that's a, that is that is quite a thing. You have been on both podcasts. We should uh, build some sort of statue in memory of this. <laughs> I will say when I saw like the first couple episodes that y'all were posting them online, I was like, this is such a good idea for a podcast. Why haven't they asked me to do this yet? And I was like, wait, they've only released a couple. <laughs> Maybe they'll ask me. And I was uh, really glad you did. Thanks for having me. So you were on the asked short you, <laughs> and you said, I've actually never seen the 1999 film The Mummy, a movie that has gained great esteem over the years and has become like a favorite of the millennial generation, if I dare say. Is there a reason you have not seen that particular movie? And how did you land on that one of all the movies when we said, like, what's a big blind spot for you? Well, I do have a reason why I haven't seen it. Um, and it's that I'm scared of mummies. Oh, man. That's it. <laughs> and, and like kind of anything that's like has that setting, <laughs> I guess it really scares me. The idea of a mummy, it really freaks me out. I have seen the, what is it, 1932 or so mummy. I, I kind of saw it as part of like a marathon. It wasn't really by choice. Anyway, I'm, I'm scared of mummies. That's why I haven't seen it. There's there's the answer. So this is not just a, where you're watching a movie for the first time. We're conquering a fear on this episode. <laughs> Yeah, I would say so. I mean, in a way, I thought, oh, one day I should make some sort of mummy themed movie because they really freak me out. <laughs> I can't explain it. Yes. Exactly yes. That on. I, w- I want in for that. I want to produce that, first <laughs> of all. So let's we can make that deal. We can make a handshake deal on this podcast <laughs> for that. Uh, yeah, I'm excited by that. So when did you so let's dig into that a little. When did you find out you were afraid of mummies? Was that something that's always been there? Was that something that happened when you saw the 1932 version? Um, I think it's just kind of always been there, you know, when there's, <laughs> I don't know how to describe this, but really, I, I think it's probably from seeing, no, I, I want to find like a, like a source point or something, but I do remember there was some kind of, um, or like, like a pyramid Egyptian thing that was very immersive in a museum. And I was pretty freaked out by that. <laughs> I don't know. Like there's just something, I don't want to sound because I, I am very interested in exploring different cultures, but I think like uh, the horror side of, of, of mummies and being mummified and like, it's just a very, I don't know, it taps into something oh. primal. <laughs> I, I get it because there is, yeah, there's a mortality thing too. Like you, you don't have any risk of running into anything real vampire or real Frankenstein, but when you do go to like a, a tomb and you see a mummified thing, you know, there's a true human corpse in there. So I guess there is a weird something that you kind of face that you don't get that with some of the other monsters that are supernatural. 
Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good point. I, I, I think that there's definitely like, I want to learn more <laughs> about the origins of it because it is so frightening to me. And I know this is more of an action adventure uh, romp, but I think I'll still be a little scared. Oh yeah. This is exciting. This is not that your fear makes me happy or anything, but I think this is like, we normally, we just watch the movie and we talk about the movie, but we can, we, this could be like a whole psychiatry session we, we have here <laughs> where we delve into the why and the how, and whether you think that you made progress once you've seen the movie, if, if dare we say you make it through the movie, because now that's a real question mark. <laughs> no, <laughs> I mean, I'm sure anything with, Dear Angel Brendan Fraser will be, you know, <laughs> I'll make it through. <laughs> Brendan would um, never hurt. Brendan would never hurt you. Peak yeah. Brendan too. Like this was him at the peak of his powers in the uh, late '90s when he was really on an upward trajectory and uh, was still getting the Keanu like kind of universal panning by critics and and fans alike. But uh, again, I it's so funny to see how this movie's been reassessed over the years, which we'll talk about on the other side after we've seen it. Exciting. <laughs> I wish I, I had more to say besides just fear of mummies, <laughs> but uh, that's what I have. Also, I was, it came out in what year? 99. 99. Okay. I was, I guess I was seven years old. <laughs> oh my about God. I, when I it came out so much for that or so um, around that age. And um, I was, I was scared of everything <laughs> like <laughs> just Halloween, Chuck E. Cheese, anything that was remotely unnerving so there's just no way i was going to be watching um something that still scares me to this day you know at that age so that was probably another reason yeah and that was a that was also a big year for movies so i could see how something from 99 could fall through the cracks that was probably the best movie year of our lifetimes although sean our lifetime goes about 15 years longer than emily's lifetime as we just <laughs> found out but uh but still i think uh arguably the best film year of our lifetime so he certainly can't hold people responsible for missing something in 99 that was a, a banner year especially not at seven years old well yeah busy <laughs> running too. away from the uh, people in costume at chuck e cheese halloween was, was real touch and go yeah <laughs> it, it really was yeah it was I started to get really into horror movies around 11 or 12, which is just a very weird switch for me. I, I'm trying to like pinpoint exactly the moments where <laughs> like it, movies switched from, you know, kind of that kids movies only to like, I want to study movies and that expanded into horror movies and everything. And it was a few years into the 2000s <laughs> before that, that switch. But um, so, so how often, Emily, now that we've kind of gone down this rabbit hole, how often are you still scared by movies? You know, I have a really, luckily, a very recent experience being scared out of my mind because um, not very often. I went, I would say I was pretty scared the first time I saw It Follows was probably the last time, which was like what, 2014 or so. And Sounds then right. I saw Talk to Me and I'm still scared. <laughs> I'm still scared going to sleep at night. That movie scared the crap out of me um, in a very good way. Like um, the audience was ooing and eyeing, and it was just like a matinee screening one day and it was it was great it was a great theatrical experience and i'm still scared so i would highlight those two movies um is the last two times i was pretty scared and I, I think that um you know the mommy will just like tap into that like i've always been scared of this thing but since it is maybe it's supposed to be a little bit more like fun times i don't think it'll haunt me but we'll see i'll, I'll report on any nightmares um yes if any. yes that would be amazing these are, these are happy mummies these are happy action mummies they're not <laughs> scary horror mummies so i think you're gonna be okay but uh that but that has that has added a whole nother layer of excitement for me to dig into this movie and talk about it because uh yeah that's uh i, I totally understand it's funny like i don't it is weird that like the mummy is kind of like a quintessential horror character, but this is not really a horror movie. So it'll be interesting to see where that lands for you. Yeah. I guess that is interesting that like as kind of a universal monster, right? Or no. Yeah. <laughs> no, it is. yeah. It is. It's maybe like amongst people now as thought of as more of like a kind of a fun franchise character, like, you know, not as much like a, like he, I guess there's no action adventure like the Invisible Man or something. Where you're like that guy is so kooky. Um, you know, it, it is interesting that mummies amongst us. I guess I think of if someone says the mummy, what word do you associate? I associate Brendan Fraser or Rachel Weisz or like whoever's in this movie. You know, like it, I would associate these like fun actors and 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 uh, themes that are in my head for some reason with this movie. 
and the reboots of, and, and uh, not so much like the universal monster, like, oh, it's really scary idea. But somehow mummies, just the ideas of mummies, very frightening to me. And I guess Talk to Me does have a mummified, slightly <laughs> adjacent element to it. So maybe that's another reason why it scared the crap out of me. But um, yeah, I think um, it is interesting culturally where the mummy and mummies in general <laughs> have fallen. Yeah, Universal's tried a few times to uh, not make a horror movie out of The Mummy as a a recent example, too, with the Tom Cruise version, which we'll touch on, too, maybe on the other side. But the various mummies and uh, and you're right, this did spawn a franchise, which maybe you'll dive into if you uh, end up liking this one. (laughs) I'm with Cameron. I'm very interested to see because it does have a tonal mash. It does have more of an adventure vibe to it than uh, many other monster attempts by Universal with their uh, monster IPs. But yeah, we're excited to see what you think of it. I feel very weird uh dare say not you guys but you know like a man talking about something i have no idea what it you know um you know as men are want to do (laughs) like talking about something they don't know anything about i'm like ah yes the mummy and mummies in general i know a lot about this let me talk about it uh so i feel like super strange um doing a pre-mummy interview not knowing what i'm talking about but i guess that's just an insight into i don't know male politicians and stuff yeah, welcome to welcome to manhood, Emily. Uh, it's <laughs> hopefully you found this freeing, and you will now wander around talking about all kinds of bullshit you have no idea about, such as <laughs> as most men. Obviously, Sean and I are not really men, so we don't count. But like <laughs> other men uh, do that. But I am. Uh, y'all know who I'm talking. Y- y'all know like the yeah. types of people I'm talking. I'm not talking. About, I would not if I didn't feel comfortable saying that here amongst friends. <laughs> like, you know, I wouldn't say. We it. just hope that we um, can impart a smidge of the unearned confidence of the white man to you with this podcast. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's what I'm. You saying. are amongst <laughs> friends and the seven or eight people who listen to this podcast. So, <laughs> well, it'll grow. <laughs> it, uh, well, it will now. So let's let's uh, let's go watch this movie, guys. I'm excited to. Uh, I'm excited to watch this. I haven't seen it in a while, so I'm excited to watch it. But I'm also excited to come back and uh, and pick Emily's brain on on where she landed and how far she got through it before she covered her face with her hands. Yep. Can't wait for this therapy session with Emily. We will return <laughs> in just a moment here to get her thoughts on the film and much more. So stay tuned. Hey there, welcome back. What was mere seconds for you, the listener? Was a deal longer for the three of us? It's now time for the sands to rise, the heavens to part, and the power to be unleashed, as the poster tagline said. When we last left off, our guest Emily Hagens had not seen The Mummy. She was late to the party, but we're glad she got here, and we welcome her back a more cultured individual, a learned film viewer now, a person who has, we hope, conquered a fear of mummified corpses. We'll see. A person who has now seen the 1999 film The Mummy, Emily, do you feel any or all of these things? Um, sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's check them all off. Yeah, no, I uh, had a great time with it. It was good to watch. <laughs> I'm excited to get into it, I guess. Did you conquer your fear of mummies? Did it get worse? Did it get better? Or do you now know that books can stop mummies and so you feel better about it? Yeah, I felt, you know, there were kind of different levels of mummies in the movie. There's um, a mummy that slowly becomes a man again. And I thought he was kind of scariest when he just had eyes. Uh, That was his peak scare for me because he was taking back everyone's flesh and and, uh, body parts, I guess. And um, and then there were kind of some uh, some guys that looked as if they were actors in costume. Those were my favorite mummies. That They were from the part where um, he goes, ah, mummies or something like that. Like after he spot a bunch of them, you know, he's like, ah, mummies. I like those guys. And then there were some guys that were just kind of, they seemed to be just CGI drones. They were okay. They were neither here nor there for me. Um, so there were a lot of different mummies in the, the mummy. And I was okay with them. I don't think I had, did I have my best? No, I don't think so. I think it was okay. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, well, yeah. it, w- it wasn't, I feel like this is a good gateway drug for mummies because they're not really scary mummies. It's more like Indiana Jones style mummies, because let's be honest, this movie really just kind of is an Indiana Jones movie. Masquerading is not an Indiana Jones movie. It's just very much like an action adventure Indiana Jones style movie that just happens to have some mummies in it. We don't even really get mummies till like the last third of the movie. 
Yeah, you know, I, I I feel like it was about halfway through when people started to get murdered. <laughs> you know, where they're like, okay, here's the deal. He's back. He's coming for the the body parts. <laughs> and um and up until then, it was kind of like a, a yeah, definitely Indiana Jones. Like we're gonna go out excavating, travel across the desert. Like I mean, it was it was just full of. I was like, man. How long did they shoot this movie? I guess that's something I could look up before we talked. But I mean, there's a lot of sets. And I, I do appreciate, you know, it's from that time where there were so many, you know, the adventure movies and world building of real sets. And it just feels like you're in it. And that's, that's so fun. Um, it, despite my fears, <laughs> but it was, there was a lot of, I just thought, you know, that the CGI held up really well. And for the most part, and because of that kind of blending of real world elements and, you know, enhancing it with, with computer effects. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. No, it's interesting. You say you thought most of the CG held up. Cause I did have a bit of the opposite effect with the, uh, a lot of the late nineties is this way. There's so much good old fashioned, like filmmaking effects and stunt work in the movie that a, a few times the CGI sticks out like a sore thumb because of that. But there are sequences like there's some where they crawl up the walls behind Brendan Fraser look really good. But then some are like a bit cartoony. The opening sequence, I mean, is a full on cartoon. Like you're you're going across the landscape and it's like on the heels of Titanic. You know, it's got all digital effects. So you finally kind of incorporate a real shot in the thing. But uh, I do think that's an issue. A lot of 90s flicks, though, that jumped on CGI really early. It dates it a little bit. But yeah, it's, it's a mixed bag to me. I see what you mean. I I should mention, I watched it on an older television. (laughs) So some things like maybe looked a little bit better than they would on somebody's newer. Like, wait, did you watch this on a, did you watch this on a tube TV? No, I, you know, you know what movie I did watch on a tube TV? Um, John Carter of Mars from, I don't know when, (laughs) 2014. I don't know. Don't quote me on that. But uh, I did watch it on the oldest TV imaginable, and it looked fantastic. <laughs> I was like, this wow. would be sensational if somebody, if these TVs were around for this movie. I don't want to get, get off on that movie, um, but <laughs> that's a whole other separate thing. But something about watching movies with dated CGI on a slightly older TV um, maybe does make it seem a little more seamless. Because I have seen parts of The Mummy on better TVs that... You know, maybe it didn't look quite as updated. I see what you mean about coming off the of Titanic. Yeah, um, definitely a leap there. <laughs> well, I've got news for you. If you don't think these uh, VFX held up, wait till you get further into this series because the Scorpion King has some of the worst visual effects in the history of visual effects. So you ain't seen nothing yet. That sounds exciting. Well, I'll, I'll find well, a very good TV for that one. The Scorpion King appears in the next movie, The Mummy Returns, which after the success of this, they started right away. And yeah, there's a famous sequence where uh, Rock's head is put onto a CGI scorpion and it looks bad before he got his own spinoff series. Yeah, there's an absurd amount of mummy movies, considering I don't think anyone but the first one even really did that well. There's a lot of these things. There's like 10 of them. It's crazy. The second one actually did well also. It just took a while to do a third one, but uh, there was a canceled fourth film. But yeah, the Scorpion King spinoff series actually got a theatrical movie. And then I think four, uh, I think there's five total. So four uh, direct video sequels, which are prequels and sequels. And like one's got Batista. I think The Rock stopped showing up in them after the first one. But uh, yeah, did they this, do this that franchise thing? Did they is, do... is all over the place. Did they do that thing like The Marine where they just started putting random wrestlers in everyone? I think so. There's probably a couple other wrestlers in them. Love it. Um, Love. I did remember a part that did that did scare me. Um, because I do have a fear of like faces appearing in objects, you know, like and it com- that comes from a Muppet's Christmas Carol when the doorknob turns <laughs> into the face and screams at him. Like I was scared of doorknobs most of my childhood from that. And um and so I do remember seeing this imagery from the mummy and being like, no way, definitely not seeing this movie. And then watching the movie last night, I was thinking this, yes, this is what really still I find quite scary is when his face was appearing in the sand, in the sandstorm and in the sand. Anyway, anytime there's a big face in the sand really frightened me. Uh, I do not like that. I mean, it's good. I mean, good job, you know, but uh, very, very scary to me, scarier than, than the mummies were for me. I love how specific your fears are. 
You gotta be specific. You're not like you're not like afraid of snakes. You're afraid of like snake faces and sand dunes. Well, the, my fear of snakes is from, and it's like, do I really want to reveal all of my fears like in a public setting, like a podcast for? Re- no I don't one know. Like, you're fine. But, you're fine. No one to this. But my fear of snakes is tied to a fear of anything that can move quickly and unpredictably. So that includes snakes, chickens, you know, bird, <laughs> cats. <laughs> Like um, people who do like, parkour. Yeah. <laughs> Anything that can move very quickly in an unpredictable direction. Uh, very, very scary. To me. <laughs> oh, no. Um, so, yes. And, the, and then, you know, we haven't talked about the bugs in the movie yet. Um, they were fun. Yeah. I, I enjoyed those. I think, the bugs fall on, I think the bugs fall under that. They move uh, strangely and quickly. Yeah. Yeah. They were they were fun. A good time. They were um, fancy I, bedazzled <laughs> bugs. Uh, they're the best kind of bug. Yeah, I, I wonder, like, kind of as a filmmaker, especially now that CGI is everywhere and it's easier than it was then. I mean, it's still hard for independent filmmakers, as we know. But it's, um, is it scarier to have one of something? Because I thought that part where the guy had one bug in him was scarier than when the hordes of bugs would come. You know what I mean? I wonder in the in the world of, of how we can kind of have everything. You know, you can get swarmed by like a million zombies or is it scary to have one really tenacious zombie i don't know like is it is less is more I, for this movie i felt like the one bug getting inside their friend who perishes first <laughs> like i felt like he was that that part i found a, a little more unsettling than the the mass amount of bugs maybe because they lingered on how it was going through his entire body that was part of it too yeah the other one that just swarms on a body and like leaves it completely <laughs> annihilated but yeah yeah, that part was cool. Oh, I love the shadow. And I know, I mean, I wonder, what do you guys think? Like, a lot of these things were done to maybe keep a certain rating or something with, like, kind of, like, lack of blood and creative ways of kind of fading out <laughs> when somebody died. But um, I really liked the shadow stuff, you know, when they were, like, sucking the life force out of the Americans. And, you know, there was some kind of shadow things on the walls. I, I thought that stuff was really clever and, and fun and felt like it harping back to old movies in a way. I don't I, I thought I liked it. I don't know, but maybe it was yeah. really, I really like TV. <laughs> I really like the shadow stuff too. I think it's much better than just like you stab a guy and he magically has no blood on him, which this movie is a huge offender of that PG-13 <laughs> yeah. no blood allowed rule. So I think like anything that can kind of get around that in a way that's more interesting than just we forgot to bring the blood today, I think is good. So I, I like the shadow stuff. I thought it, it did a good job. And it, plus it fits the genre of like kind of 30s swashbuckling movie so i i think it i i like that stuff yeah and you mentioned the group of americans it was a kind of a, a generic group of white dudes including like a great value josh brolin in the group mm-hmm. that all <laughs> become fodder for the mummies yeah they were like give me a good looking brown haired guy a good looking blonde haired guy a dude with glasses just a bunch of generic white dudes who I don't think I've ever seen in any movie ever. It was just like, their names are like Kip and like just actors no one has ever heard of. I don't know where they found these guys. Yeah, and that one guy, his fault was having glasses. Like that was his demise. <laughs> Very sad. Um, yeah. You're right. And isn't he the one that he took the eyeballs from? That's weird. Yeah, why would we're, have we're those thinking Emotep actually couldn't see that well. <laughs> Maybe that's why he ran right into Brennan Fraser's sword at the end. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> That's also why you couldn't see them reading the book right behind him in that room. Yeah. The whole there time. we go. He took he took the blind guy's eyeballs. <laughs> oh my god! I did not think of that in the moment. I was just along for the ride. Yes, other people said I saw on Letterbox the mummy loved to like lower his jaw several feet. <laughs> yeah. That was, uh, I don't know if that's a trope of mummies. <laughs> I don't know what that. I, I, I don't think mummies are supposed to have jaws. I don't think mummies <laughs> have jaws. Isn't that part of that's the That's the trope of uh, new VFX uh, abilities in the late 90s <laughs> yeah. as we were talking about. We learned yeah. that one and then every movie had to have that. Every ghost could do that. Every every demon could do that. Yeah, it became a thing that they learned how to do in VFX and put it on every single character. That's Pennywise cool. was still doing that in the recent uh, It versions. It was. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I've, yeah, I guess it is like a thing. But the um, the amount of um, of uh, shooting, they really just kind of shoot at everything the whole time. There is a it lot kills, of... It kills no one. It, they shoot <laughs> at stuff the whole time and it doesn't work, but they got these bullets and they might as well use them, right? Like in this world, the only thing that kills people are books. But like, <laughs> we're going to keep using guns because for reasons, I, I, I don't understand where they got all the bullets. There, there's a lot of, uh, let's not dig too deep in this one, but like, 
Yeah, books kill people, not which I've been saying for years. Books kill people, not guns. The humans shot a lot of humans more than they uh, effectively did anything with the supernatural elements. They uh, they kept shooting up the guy, the protector group, the magi group. A lot of deaths that way. And then at some point, the guy's like, let's stop. Enough people have just been shot in front of us all. Yeah. Let's talk this out. He became their friend. They went on a on a ride together. <laughs> we also never found out how that guy survived certain death. He went he went into like a suicide mission and then they get out the end and they're like, surprise, it's me. I'm here for the sequel. <laughs> I did uh, wonder. He really is, though. actually. Yeah. Yeah. He he is. If, you, yeah if you're interested, the uh, the sequel, which, like I said, mentioned they, they jumped right on it because this was pretty successful. It has like the entire core of the group that lived at the end of the movie showing up again. And it's like full continuation. So not to fun. not to sell you. I will say one issue that this has happened with like Critters and other movies where you conflate some stuff that was in the sequel with part one. I'm watching this first movie and not to spoil anything, Emily, but there's characters that show up again in two that I kept thinking were showing up at the end of this one. And Cameron, I don't know if you remember that either, but there's a whole storyline with the uh, Emotep's wife that he's trying to resurrect where she does I show was, up again too. I was floored by how little of this movie I remembered. Like I just, not only just, I, I don't remember the specific scene, but like, I didn't remember it was much, I keep using the term for lack of a better one, but like it, it was much more Indiana Jones than I remembered and much less like, quote unquote horror movie. I mean, it's not really horror, but I remembered so little of it that it wasn't like I remembered two instead of one. I don't think I remembered shit about either one of them. Truthfully, it's like I've seen the mummy a couple times, mostly in the 99 and the early aughts. But like, I don't think I've seen the mummy in like 15 years. So, yeah, I, I hadn't I don't think I remembered much of anything, which made That's it a fun funny. watch. Yeah, I thought my impression was that it was very it was almost like a kids movie adventure movie. That was what I went in thinking. And then there were some very horrific elements to it. And I was like, this would really scare me. <laughs> I'm sure of it if I was a kid. And uh, and now, yeah, I know some some parts of it. But um, I, I guess it went a little bit more horror than I expected. because I, I just had this idea of like little quips and those things were in the movie. But it, I feel like you mentioned it'd be a good gateway movie into mummy, <laughs> your mummy fear or my mummy fear. But I'll, be, uh, I'll tell you what, <laughs> I'll tell you what was probably the scariest movie to you as like a 10 year old was like chicken run. Wait, how did you know that? How do you know I'm so scared of chicken run? Wait, oh, because you chickens? admitted you're scared you of running chickens. chickens. <laughs> chickens. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, <laughs> did, you th- did you think I was in your brain just now? Yeah, that, was, <laughs> that movie scared me so bad. I saw that movie and The Faculty. So I was just starting to get into horror movies the same night. And I loved The Faculty. And Chicken Run gave me the worst nightmares of my life. Like, I was that's so hilarious. scared. <laughs> that's a horror um, double feature for the ages right there. Yeah, that's a you know, kid getting into horror movies. Yeah, that movie uh, really, really frightened me and made me kind of hungry. <laughs> I saw a trailer for the second one just came out. And I was like, I don't think I'm going to watch this. No, I will. I probably will. But I have um, a question. How did Catherine Zeta-Jones not get cast in the Rachel Vice role? Like, yeah. that was the Catherine Zeta-Jones role of that era. I don't know how they landed on Rachel Vice, who's very good in the movie, by the way. And this is kind of like the movie that broke her out. But, like, just seemed perfectly Catherine Zeta-Jones. Right in, like, that sweet spot time period for her. Like, she must right. have had it. Her agent must have passed on it or something. I'm sure he got yelled at. Yeah, maybe she had a kind of- a conflicting is this the time of like Zorro and stuff I, I'm not sure. yeah a couple years after it oh, okay wow yeah I don't know that's a good question I would she, she would be great too everyone was great you know I, I feel like some things with her character maybe in 2023 we wouldn't do you know but like yes, very uh, much so <laughs> That's kind of a blanket statement for like some aspects of the movie. Um, but that's like movies stand in their place in time and culture and everything. And we learn and we grow everything. Okay. That's my statement on that. But like, <laughs> but she was very good. <laughs> uh, the acting was great. I've all, you know, we talked about the, the Americans were, you know, they were kind of like a little three stooges group of people to be killed, but like, you know, just like it was a really the key cast. They were very fun and delightful. And I, re- yeah. but I don't Brandon, remember his Brandon. name. Not him. I do remember his name. Uh, the, her brother, though. I really like. Oh, him John Hanna well. from uh, Hanna. Weddings and a Funeral. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. He basically he plays the same character in every single movie. Yeah. He plays uh-huh. like that skeevy kind of like getting into shenanigans. He's like that guy and everything, but he's great at it. Brendan Fraser was actually much better than I remembered in this, and uh, kind of makes you wonder why he didn't become a much bigger star on the back of this uh, yeah. than he actually did. And I loved the. Uh, I love the the bad guys lackey. Brendan Fraser's like 
foil Ooh, the whole Benny. Movie. Who, Benny, who just you're just waiting for him to get it. Like you know, there's going to be a cut scene where Benny gets it, and it's so great when that finally happens. Like Benny, like maybe more than any movie I can remember, Benny is consistently getting into shenanigans and messing stuff up for everybody. And like the whole movie builds to him just like eating it. And it's so beautiful when it finally happens. It's great because I don't know how y'all felt. I mean, I felt a little bit bad for the mummy um, and all of the things he had gone through. <laughs> you know? and well, that's it's what like, makes it great, right? Like that's what makes yeah. it great is that the mummy, he's not really a bad guy. Not, I mean, he kind of is, but it's like a for love. You're allowed to be a bad guy for love. It's like the Wayne's World thing where it's like if you kill a man in the heat of battle, like, a, it, like love causes people to do that stuff. So he was like, he wasn't doing anything he didn't think was right. And he was just, he just wanted love. And there's some, something kind of strange and sad about that. Yeah, he had yeah. like a Romeo and Juliet arc. If you look at it from his point of view, he he was just trying to resurrect his love. Yeah, and it's like it was almost like the primal thing driving him as soon as he was awoken. Like it wasn't, there wasn't just a moral quandary for him. <laughs> he was just like, this is what I'm supposed to do, which makes Benny so great because you really want to see him, you know, <laughs> get his comeuppance. But I, I wasn't eager to see the mummy get his comeuppance. You know, because I was like, oh, that poor guy. <laughs> Um, but it's a really, you know, that was a nice thing to have, you you know, to still have that real bad smarmy guy that you're like, yeah, get him, get him. <laughs> yeah. Benny um, does some of the bad guy heavy lifting yeah. <laughs> for M- Imhotep, the actual bad guy, because he's, he's much more relatable than Benny. Who's just a complete weaselly scoundrel. I did kind of blurt laugh at that scene where they, they finally cut to the hotel and Emotep's sitting there under a mask, just like chilling in the hotel, talking to yeah. the guy he's already taking his tongue. Send, send and in Benny, the lobby Benny like John Wick. And is just like, he just needs more of you. <laughs> like, he's going to take your skin now. He's just like sitting in the lobby like John Wick 3. Just like yeah, it was just a funny smash cut out. to like the hotel of Emotep in full, full garments and a mask, like hanging out. Yeah, that was hilarious. Like, if this is passable, he can go anywhere. <laughs> that was That's right, a moment yeah. for me. But yeah, just like the the kind of sets around that part of, I mean, I guess I was just always surprised when they'd introduce a new set and it would just kind of be for one sequence and then it'd be a whole other grand set. I'm like, this is very exciting to me. And the most recent movie I saw that I felt like was like that, maybe y'all will think of a better one, I don't know, was the um, first of the Kenneth Branagh um, movies. With oh, the, the uh, Inspector like Perot films. Yeah, what, what is it called? The, the Murder, Murder on the Orient Express. Yeah. Orient Murder Express, on the Orient Express yeah. had some beautiful sets in it. And, and definitely not has good ones too, but it's like, uh, maybe I'm just really excited for the, the next one that's about to come out. I don't know, but I just remember when I when I saw that movie, I was like, "These are those sets again that we were that we had in like the early 2000s, and then of course movies long before that." But I just feel like it's been a while since we've really been in big exciting sets, just for kind of like one sequence, and then it's like, okay, it's not just like but, here's the hero set forever, and that's why we put all the work into it. Of course, Barbie, but that was like you know that it's it's more fantastical, you know, like. Um, but, uh, yeah, the mummy harkens back to those days where they shot for like 260 days. Exactly. Yeah. Shoot, like you don't feel you don't feel the the fastness of it. It's just like you feel like they built that set, shot there for like a week, and then just burnt it down or something just because they could. Yeah, according to the wiki, they did have to move deserts to like a couple different countries due to different things. They they initially couldn't shoot in Egypt like they wanted, so did the bulk in Morocco, but also bounced around a bit. So I'm sure that added to the budget. But let me actually segue that into some of the development of this because Universal obviously is known for their monster IPs, and they've tried and stumbled and failed to relaunch them into horror franchises multiple times as recently as a few years ago with the Tom Cruise mummy that was kind of DOA, but we'll talk about that after. But this one was in development all through the 80s and 90s, and it saw like everybody from Clive Barker and Mick Garris writing drafts, filmmakers like Joe Dante, George Romero attached to direct at different points. One point even, I think someone had locked in Daniel Day-Lewis to do a more Karloff-style version of The Mummy, the brooding guy with the tape all over him. And uh, in the mid-90s, Universal ends up going with the script by Kevin Jarr, who had done Glory, Judgment Night, Tombstone. So he he had a little bit of a resume. And he's the one who first pitched it as more Indiana Jones meets Jason and the Argonauts, which that makes sense now because there is even like a skeleton battle at one point. Indiana Jones meets Jason and the Argonauts is the absolute perfect description of this movie. I was going to say, I watched the movie with my mom and she goes, well, somebody liked Jason and the Argonauts. <laughs> that was like yeah, the one piece right? of commentary on the movie. <laughs> you cannot like, fight a, a resurrected skeletal structure at all without accidentally or deliberately <laughs> referencing that movie. But 
Yeah, Stephen Summers came in and also kind of locked it into that 1920s setting. And uh, he, to that point, had only directed some like live action Disney stuff, like that first Jungle Book adaptation, the Elijah Wood Huck Finn movie. And right before this, he did Deep Rising, which is kind of a favorite of ours. We always talk about for a couple Classic. of things, kills and stuff in it. Treat Williams on a boat. That's right. We should be so lucky to get Treat Williams on a boat again. But yeah, to uh, everybody's point, I think that 1920s setting helped it. I do think some of the uh, dynamic with Rachel Weiss that might not be privy to today's modern lens was also playing back to those old serials because it wasn't just like a 1999 vibe. It was a little bit more of the screwball comedy kind of dynamic with the two of them that harkened back to decades prior. Yeah, and big damsel in distress vibes. She had like big damsel in distress vibes. Yeah. Didn't and, they uh, even say that when they were getting the, the pilot? They're like, rescue the damsel. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. I feel like they did. But yeah, I think that's why it's a little more like I was, you know, you're like, well, anyway, it's yeah, totally agree. <laughs> like it's part of that era that they're referencing as well. And then, and that's why you're like, okay, this is what the whole vibe that they're creating. Never mind. Uh, Catherine Zeta Jones feeling like she should have been the lead. That felt like it was supposed to be Wilford Brimley. The pilot was like full Wilford Brimley vibes. Oh, that guy was <laughs> awesome. I love that they brought I was like, is that back. Brian Doyle Murray? Yeah. And he's like an actor I didn't know. I looked him up. <laughs> I love yeah. they brought that guy back. Such a nothing character. He just shows up drunk and complaining. And they're like, we'll put you to work, bud. And he's like, fuck it. Let's do it. He's just like flying them off into the dirt. I was, oh, I love it. So good. Sand, not dirt. Yeah. In that vibe, <laughs> though, they they shot this toward every major Hollywood actor, including Tom Cruise, who, funny enough, later played a lead in a Mummy movie. But Brad Pitt, all these different people. And uh, Summers is the one that ended up saying not only is a... Uh, Brendan Fraser on the rise and cheaper, but he really fits that Errol Flynn vibe a little more. And I think he does. Like, again, I'm, I'm with you, Cam. I, I think he was a punchline by this point, him and Keanu back in the day. And he's really not bad in this. He does the Errol Flynn kind of character pretty well. No, I think he's great in it, man. I really do. He does do Errol Flynn perfect. And like, I think, I don't think people understand now how big of a star he was in that moment. Like he was every bit the young DiCaprio or the young Keanu Reeves. Like he was every bit the next big thing that those guys were. And it just, for whatever reason, didn't happen. It's kind of sad because he's, I think he's every bit the actor those guys were at that age. And uh, you see it now with the whale and some of the stuff that's happening now. But I'm so glad that he's back because, yeah, I didn't think he got a fair shake. When did he get those injuries? Because didn't he say he got some injuries that were difficult for him? Back injuries or something? I do oh. see right here that Brendan Fraser reveals that he nearly died while filming a scene in The Mummy. And the first installment of the franchise, there's a hanging scene and the rope is around his neck tightened too much during the shot. Oh. I don't know if that's what we're talking about, but... Yeah, he says, uh, I think I see a thing where, like, just the Mummy movies in general, the first two, just doing all the stunts... Caused him to have back problems, and knee replacement. Yeah, partial knee replacement, operations on his back, bolting various compressed spinal pads together. Yeah. I mean, you, you don't hear Tom Cruise complaining. <laughs> He's got phaetons, though. That's why. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm, I'm, so, <laughs> I, I'm so excited for his comeback these days. Do y'all watch Doom Patrol? I do, no, yeah. It's not on anymore. Even though he's not uh, on the show technically, but it's, it's him. You know, I what I love about both his performance and then the um, the other guy, Matt Bomer. Bomer, yeah. Um, both of their they're so united with the physical like actor, like their their vocal performance and the the physical performance feel just like totally working on just a level that I just think is very masterful about that. I mean, that shows a lot of very goofy stuff in it, but I, I'm just like floored by how well those two performances work and these like very emotional scenes at times where you see no expression on their face. But I've cried a couple of times watching this show, like because you just like not seeing an expression, but knowing there's like feeling there. And I think that's just a great aspect of the the physical you know, the, the actor that's actually there in the suit and then, and, and then the, the vocal performance as well. Like, and I just, I love whenever he did make an appearance on the show and I know it's like just gone forever or something in the, in the change from HBO to Max. It's just like, we're yeah. ready for the rest of that show. But I thought he was wonderful in that even just mostly as a vocal performance. 
it's funny but, going back to old universal monsters when they started remaking them in the 50s like claude rains famously the reason the family opera mask is what it is is he's like no i'm an actor i'm not covering up my face you're gonna put like a little baby quarter mask on me and that's become yeah. his iconic look from the musical and stuff like that but actors were so absorbed with that and and even studios you know for the first wave of superhero movies it's like find a reason to take their mask off we need to see their eyes we need to see their face and that's kind of gone away actors nowadays don't have that same ego about it and cameron if you're unfamiliar with doom patrol it's this offbeat uh, superhero team from DC and, and in all honesty Stanley kind of ripped it off for X-Men for Marvel they have a, a really quirky TV series that survived a couple app changes when DC turned into HBO Max which turned into Max so the fact that it ran a few years itself is a miracle but Matt Bomer not ugly Brendan Fraser known star not ugly both are completely covered up on that show and all several seasons of it like they are, they are characters who never show their faces which is kind of amazing you lost me in DC, but uh, I, I've heard good things about it. I've heard Unrelated it. to the Snyderverse, but yeah, it, it is its own little quirky thing that li lives in its own little bubble. So it's not related to a larger universe. I'll add, it my very show. <laughs> I'll add it to my list of about 80 TV shows that I'm not caught up on. I will agree, though, that Fraser was that like peak good looking Brendan Fraser at this time, too. He was coming off George of the Jungle, which was a big hit. And that was part of why they cast him, too. So he could do the, the indie drama stuff, which he did plenty of. And then he was starting to become, like Cameron said, like more of a mainstream guy. It sucks that the mummy kind of ended up ruining him overall, I guess, physically down the road. But yeah. To that point, when uh, Emily, I don't know if you know this, but like when people do those Twitter prompts of like, what was your bisexual awakening? A lot of people will always reference Desperado for Selma Hayek and Antonio Banderas being sweaty and hot. And second only to that movie, I swear to God, is always The Mummy because it's Rachel Weisz and Brendan Fraser being uh, sweaty hot people also. I saw that on Letterboxd, but then I'm like, well, a lot of, I feel like a lot of movies say something like that's on Letterboxd. <laughs> so I was like, oh, maybe it's just the Letterboxd way. Letterboxd is where the view. horny film viewers go. <laughs> My sexual awakening was uh, Chicken Run. A lot of people don't know that. Don't you dare say that. <laughs> don't you dare soil the good name of Chicken Run. <laughs> Oh, um, man. Kidding. Don't write letters. Uh, so, Emily, I, I have a question for you. The Mummy is one of 17 films that cracked $100 million in 1999, probably the best movie year of our lifetime. Where does it, where did it rank in the box office rankings that year? Oh, it was like a trivia question. Oh, yeah, yeah. We, we hit you with the hard-hitting stuff. Here. I don't know why you've turned this into trivia questions. Not because <laughs> I like trivia. Yeah, Leave me ahead. alone and let me have my no, moment. Fair enough. For a movie I saw yesterday, <laughs> yes. um, let me think, uh, 1999, what did we get that year? What was 99? Uh, Matrix? Was Matrix? No. Yes, yes, Matrix. Yes, was okay. Movie. That would be above the mummy. Wait, you're asking like, I bet it's like top five or something. I'll say number five. You're not far off. It's number eight. It's behind only... Star Wars, The Phantom Menace, The Sixth Sense, Austin Powers, The Spy Who Shagged Me, Toy Story 2, The Matrix, Tarzan, and of all movies, Big Daddy. Adam Sandler, killer. Big Daddy, number seven. <laughs> <laughs> number seven, Big Daddy. You can't compete with wow. that. Yeah, you can't. Okay. I will say That's this. I, the, one, the one thing I know about 99 is that Mummy probably would have been a little higher, but I do recall it got buried a couple weeks into its run because Phantom Menace came in and just took over the place. Yeah. Uh, that same May. Yeah, that happened. I'm it cra still it's had crazy a great opening. Yeah, it's crazy to me that Tarzan and Big Daddy both had higher box office for the movie. That's wild. I guess Tarzan really? shouldn't yeah. surprise me because it's like Disney, You like but... George of the Jungle? How about an animated version? That's right. I loved both of those movies. <laughs> I, mean, I like both those movies, too. I like in Big Daddy when he's trying to spell Rizzuto. He keeps calling it Rerudo. <laughs> I mean, I was um, seven. Uh, so, I mean, like Tarzan was what I was seeing at that time. So that was, it's checking out for me. I didn't see the matrix till I was an adult. And actually I feel comfortable saying this. I did not like it. I thought it was terrible. And then I got convinced to watch all three matrix movies. And I was like, I can't sit through that again. And I loved it. I loved all three of them. I thought it was amazing. <laughs> I thought you were going to say, and then I realized part one was not bad because I watched the sequel. Because the other no. two were so bad. I loved, I loved the They're whole thing. They're not as thing. good. <laughs> but something the, about the years it, have been kind of those i feel like they've been reassessed much like the mummy i think they, yeah. they, the, the folks have been kind of those sequels over the years i have a problem with movies that are tinted yellow or green like it, it really kind of makes me um like a little sick to my stomach 
which is another thing I was a little worried about with the mummy. So I had this idea in my head. It was very yellowish, orange in tint, but it wasn't, it wasn't tinted or maybe not on my old TV that I was watching it on <laughs> last night. That's but, more of a um, brown movie. Like it's just dust. It's not, yeah. it's not like Soderbergh put a yellow filter over the movie so much. I'm like trying to think of yellow movies. What's a yellow movie? Green Matrix I mean, is totally green. Traffic yeah. famously is super blue in America and super yellow when they're in Mexico. Like to the point that it's just like a single color. It might as well just be uh, a sepia of those colors. Yeah, I would do Soderbergh movies as an example of yellow movies. I actually haven't seen the TV show Breaking Bad because I was getting very sick to my stomach in the first in the pilot episode. <laughs> and I was like, why am I? I'm pausing. He just hates the up. desert, I think. I think he hates yeah, <laughs> Anakin Jr. Anakin, over here. yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. It's like something about like a tinted, like kind of a wash over a movie that's yellow or green and just kind of... Um, that was a late it. 90s thing too because early Fincher stuff's got a green tint. The Matrix certainly yeah. as, a, as a franchise has a green tint. Well, they also started doing that uh, bleach bypass where everything started to look really like blown out and, and whitish. Like everybody was doing all kinds of weird stuff with, with that process. So, yeah, you got a bunch of stuff that looked like a bunch of weird colors. And thankfully, that's mostly gone. But. Like a Tony Scott movie or that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Tony Scott movies were blue, weren't they? Yeah. Oh, I thought you meant like the bleach thing. Oh, he did the bleach bypass a lot. I think yeah. it's <laughs> Saving Private Ryan when they get the bleach bypass. Yes. You know, and I saw that in the theater not that long ago. And it, it made me a little sick to my stomach as well. But I, I think I've gotten a little bit better about it over the years but it, it does you know and horror movies tend to do it too from time to time actually in our <laughs> uh paper street plug in our um segment of scare package and cold open we would differentiate the different movies Shawn michael is pertaining to be in by putting like a wash over different you know this one's a little greener it's a little bit more brown and this one's blue and uh, to kind of show that he was like playing a part in all these different movies and i was thinking when we were working on that that it was uh i was like i will never do this again just to make a yeah. point <laughs> but uh or to differentiate you know the so for, for the viewer but you know it is a tool of movies and it can create an unsettling feeling within without doing anything else you know so it, it is it is definitely a tactic that works on my stomach and probably other people. <laughs> but yes, I do like the matrix now. Uh, like the whole thing, I like two, I like three, I like four. And, uh, um, yeah, let's say, I'm Would a you fan. say you celebrate the Wachowski's entire catalog. Um, Sorry, it's, it's an office space joke, but I don't I, uh, think anybody, even their biggest defenders, celebrate their whole catalog. I respect yeah. them for swinging for the fences, but boy, they have some strikeouts. Like you cannot How dare you that. speak ill of speed racer. I love Speed Racer. Yeah. That's not the one I'm talking about. But what else have they done? Speed Racer Bound? Cloud Atlas to me was a miss. Oh, I like Cloud Atlas. Oh. We should do an episode on Cloud Atlas. No. I need to revisit Matrix 4 because I walked out of there like, what? The I loved it. Very polarizing. <laughs> I know some people love it. I know I, I want to revisit it. I, I need to give it a second shot. Did they Emily's. do looking it up? Yes, they did. Jupiter Ascending. Oh, there yeah, you go, that. Cam. That was a <laughs> demo, was I, it? I enjoyed that, but yeah. boy, oh boy, it's it's rough. It is. I did not think that was them. Spent like two hundred million dollars to like remake a Flash Gordon movie with a dogman bounty hunter with flying skates. Ooh, it was them. It's crazy. Never mind. Yeah. Yikes. Uh, yeah, that one was not good. <laughs> There you go. Um, See, confirmed. They do have some strikeouts. So they have some home runs too. So I also feel like question. we've gotten radically off the point. Yeah, here. I was going to say, let me let me bring it back. The more important question, have either of you ridden the rides at Universal or Hollywood or Orlando? Scared of mummies didn't, did not. Oh, that was no a way. real fear. You weren't playing around. <laughs> well, will you go on it now? Because it is an indoor coaster. It's actually a pretty legit ride. Yeah, maybe. No, probably not. No. <laughs> ah, come on. So she's not conquered her fears is what we're learning here. This therapy not session in, was a complete waste of time. Not in, um, it's, it's a good time to mention my next fear, which is haunted houses, real haunted, like the ones like, uh, not real haunted, like a uh, house of terror style haunted houses, like anything right. where like a mummy is coming at me. I don't want that. No. <laughs> so like, so like the haunted houses where people can like touch you and stuff. That's like your nightmare yeah. fuel. Absolutely. And it, it always has been. And for my 16th birthday, because like horror movies, some friends thought it'd be fun to like, because my birthday is really close to Halloween, to have like a, a haunted house that I'd have to walk through. And at the end, everyone would jump out and say, surprise, it's your birthday party. And what I thought was happening was that I was going to die because my name was written inside the haunted house. And it was just me and my, my 10th grade boyfriend. 
And I was like, we're going to die. This is a murder plot to kill us. And he's like, no, it's okay. Let's really get through the thing. And I've never been so scared for my life. And at the end, everyone jumps out and says, happy birthday, and almost passed out. I thought it was like, so scary. It was a very sweet idea, but it like really like hit the nail on the coffin for like how scared I am of haunted houses <laughs> in general. So yeah. the mummy ride is in the category of haunted house for me in term- versus like a an outdoor coaster type uh, situation. But um, How many I, of those friends have you not spoken to since that? Honestly, a few. No, I'm just kidding. No, they're all. Um, <laughs> yeah, and no, actually, <laughs> not because of that, but. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, yeah, no, it's a, uh, it was a very well-intentioned, um, it was a well-intentioned birthday extravaganza that made me fear for my life. Um, in, in my mind, you dumped that boyfriend halfway through the haunted house. <laughs> I could not believe the amount of people. I felt like I was in Rosemary's baby. Like the amount of people being like, go ahead, go in. And I was like, I do not want to go in there. There's no one else here. And, um, they're like, it's fine. It was all in all just the most bizarre night of my life. Yeah. But anyway, mommy, uh, mommy ride, you know, maybe, maybe, I don't know. I guess it is not quite a haunted you'll, house. You'll know all mind, the stuff. You'd be like, Oh, those are the scarab beetles. Oh, there's a pop-up fake mummy guy. You'll we know. should do a late to the party. We should do a late to the party field trip where the three of us go ride the ride and we record Emily's reaction going in and coming out of the ride. I got out of line. I was in line for the ride and I got out of line and said, no, I'm not doing it. And some little kids laughed at me. Oh, you were laughing, but horror um, movie filmmaker Emily Higgins, despite the fact that this movie did everything in its power to go away from like the wrapped up corpses because they thought that was a punchline by the time the movie got made and they, they went a whole different route. She still can't conquer the fear of any form of mummy. It turns out. Yeah. Not, yeah. No, I don't think so. The, when they suck the life out of those guys, like just suck their energy and life out. I, I mean, that was, that was unsettling. I don't know. <laughs> I love that we live in a world where uh, I go to Fantastic Fest and see Emily going into these like crazy movies with all kinds of messed up shit in it. But like Gravity. Chicken Rod and the Mummy are where she draws the hard line. It's true in a, in a way. Yeah. <laughs> it, like when I think of imagery, I'm like, I don't know if I could watch that again. But Chicken Run, it doesn't like instill a fear in in me to this day where I get a little bit of like goosebumps thinking about chicken run. <laughs> but the mummy is more just like certain things, face in the sand. I mean, yeah, energy sucked out, bodies, those things and the and just like the concept of mummies. The you may not watch it again, another. but are you are you glad you saw it to check it off the list of nothing else? Yeah, definitely. You know, I've, I've just seen little bits and pieces of it. I love Brendan, love Rachel, <laughs> love the brother. What is his name? Not Jack uh, Hanna. John Hanna. John Hanna. John Hanna. <laughs> John Hanna. They were a great trio. Um, Love the adventure aspects, the large sets, the people that were mummies in costume, the Jason and the Argonauts aspects. Like, I overall, you know, actually, if it was playing in a theater, I, I would see in a theater just to get that that experience. Probably, maybe, maybe I'd have more gripes with the CGI <laughs> in that case. But. Tell your mom to uh, pull up a chair and watch the sequel with her, because again, I think it leans a little sillier. Plus, Rachel Weisz has a lot more to do in part two. And uh, if you just want to stick with these characters a little longer, I, I do think it's even less horror and more kind of goofy action in part two, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, Peacock wants to play part two within three seconds of finishing. No kidding, yeah, I have to meet you. Right away. <laughs> yeah. Shot right to the next movie, right when the credits hit. <laughs> but, yeah, you know, probably will. Probably will see it. Um, Want to see what happens to all these guys. And um, it was a really, it was a really fun watch. It was nice to just, like, see more than the pieces because it really, it was very, pl- you know, as much as I joke, like, it was, you know, there's unsettling aspects on it. And I am scared of mummies. All that aside. I did like that it did take those horror turns from time to time because I just wasn't expecting that. I just thought it would be like even more kid friendly than it was. So it was kind of fun to be like, oh, this gets a little bit adult uh, and very cleverly avoid showing the blood and things for these that PG, PG-13, whatever rating. So it, it would if mummies weren't a specific fear for me, I think at that age where I was getting into horror movies, this would have been a great movie to watch. Um but I'm glad to have seen it now as a 30 year old, <laughs> still a tad scared. You got, I mean, it's like, if, you, if you're just like 
I guess this is my philosophy. I like to admit when I'm scared and I like to be scared because I think if it, if you like horror movies, you're like, I'm never scared. It's like, well, what are you having fun with? Like, you know, nothing scares me. I'm invincible. Um, exactly. Like, it's, it's really nice to play into things because I think part of me is like tapping into that childhood fear, you know, not so much. Like yeah. the movie talked to me, I think I might have mentioned before, really, really scared me to a point where I wasn't able to sleep after I watched that movie. Like it really, really legitimately scared me aspects of the mummy it scared me in a way that reminded me of my childhood which is what i love to tap into as a filmmaker and that's what was really a great time with that movie it's very inspiring to watch stuff like that that makes you kind of feel like a kid again on the adventure and and with the kind of frightening aspects of it and just the kind of clever unique filmmaking like the shadow work and stuff so i don't mean to be like the mummy's the greatest movie ever i just had a i just had a really good time with it and i'm glad we chose it for this no, I love that. I love that. And I totally agree. I wish you, I wish I scared more easily for that exact reason. So but while we wrap up here, any other blind spots in like the monster movie world, universal monsters, stuff like that. Any other big blind spots? Hmm. I, I haven't seen the original Frankenstein. Um, Wait, the original. what? Yeah. <laughs> I did okay, not well, come up when you were mentioning you saw the original mummy. I thought for sure, like, oh, she must have done. I thought you said you even did a marathon of like the original ones. I may have misheard. I've seen yeah, the other yeah. ones. <laughs> Frankenstein, Frankenstein is the De Niro one. one. <laughs> it's one of legitimately one of the greatest movies ever made. We'll have to have you back to talk about Frankenstein because that's. I'd I'm love about. to. Yeah. I'm excited to. <laughs> well, I was going to watch it this, this Halloween because I had missed it on the last. Well, well, don't hold out for us. Before. If you want to watch it, you can watch it. Don't hold out for us. <laughs> um, so that's one. Um, I'm, you know, I'm sure there are others. There's always more movies to be discovered. I'm, I'm mm-hmm. excited to keep seeing what movies y'all choose for your podcast and what people haven't seen because it is interesting. We have some shocking ones lined up. Yeah, stuff that you will just be <laughs> blown away people haven't seen. Emily, beyond uh, like monster and genre stuff, is there any certain like period genre, foreign film, westerns, or a type of movie you kind of consider a bigger blind spot that you're just not as learned on as you would be maybe some genre stuff? Oh, like like a whole genre, like westerns or something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, definitely westerns. I would say. <laughs> uh, you know, I have not seen the most noir movies. I've seen a good bit of the classic ones, but I feel like there's a, there's a whole lot of noir I haven't seen. I'm trying to think of anything else. I mean, we talked about a couple of other movies for this that I hadn't seen. I haven't seen Gladiator. I haven't seen The Notebook, which we talked about maybe doing. What else? But then we'd all have to watch The Notebook. (laughs) Uh, I suppose suppose so. However, I just, you know, saw Barbie a second time. So I was like, I could have watched another Ryan Gosling movie. He's he's great. Let me be clear. It's not the worst movie. I don't like Nicholas it's a good, it's a good as a human it's a good or writer, movie. but it is, it's fine. And McAdams and Gosling like carry the movie because they're just charming. Nice to look at good actors. And <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it is, it is just, it's the schmaltzy stuff that Nicholas Sparks does in all his movies where you're like, you know, like some tragedies coming, but there's also just like very vanilla stuff going on, but like yeah. a slow train wreck. Kind we'll of thing. not do that one for an episode is my point. <laughs> <laughs> I think there are like a good bit of um, you know, best picture winners I haven't seen and you know, the I'm I'm sure that there there are movies, maybe there are movies y'all will cover that I will be like, oh no, I haven't seen that either. I'm glad I wasn't the guest. <laughs> yeah, we came we came really close to doing Gladiator. Gladiator was the one that kind of first came up that we were talking about doing. But I'm glad we ended up landing on the mummy because I Me haven't too. seen the mummy in a long time and I'm glad I got to rewatch it. It's a great movie to end because it's, you know, kind of the end of summer right now when we're recording it. So it's a great, you know, you said it came out in the summer of 99. So, it's, you know, it's kind of a great way to end the summer. It's an action adventure movie. In a hot um, desert. In a hot, hot <laughs> desert. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I'm glad we watched it because it was just, it wasn't really like at the top of my list before. And now I'm really glad to have seen it. So thanks for picking it. No, thanks for coming on and, and talking about it. Uh, you got anything you want to want to plug, want to promote, want to talk about anything upcoming, any anything you just want to uh, make the people aware of before we end this thing? Yeah, I mean, might as well say we all you know had a movie come out earlier this year. Sorry about the demon on Shutter and it's on DVD and stuff. So for a comedy. And that's kind of what I had most recently in the paper streets. So it makes sense. Um, and of course, you know, we collaborate on Square Package as well. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say the, the paper street movies that we worked on together because yeah. um, that seems right. So that's what I would like to plug. If you're listening to this and you have not seen Sorry About the Demon, what are you even doing with your life? 
what, like Emily, Sean, and I doing a podcast. If you said this is the podcast I want to listen to, then sorry about the demon is a movie you want to watch for the exact same <laughs> reasons. So it's a wonderful movie. Emily did an amazing job with it, and I was uh, lucky to be a part of it. So yeah, do yourself a favor and go watch it. It's on Shutter along with every other movie we've ever made, pretty yeah. much. If you like and, that uh, and the lead of it, John Michael Simpson, who congrats to him with a baby on the way. Yeah, you should go watch Scare Package also, which starts off with an Emily banger as well, featuring the very same John Michael Simpson. Yeah. Well, Emily, thank you for uh, coming and slumming it with us for for an hour here. And uh, we won't take up any more of your time, but we very much appreciate it. And hopefully we can do it soon uh, with Frankensteiner Gladiator. <laughs> It's going to feature that. Sounds like a hoot. Um, That's right. Yeah. Or Mummy Returns. Or well, Mummy Returns. I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, we could. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for having me. This was, this was really fun. Thank you. All right. Emily. Thanks, Emily. Thanks again to Emily for that. That was a fun watch. I was actually glad I, I revisited The Mummy. It's one of those ones. I'm like you, Cam. I, I knew the movie. I was surprised how much I didn't remember. I'm sitting there telling my wife, like, I have no memory of the scene, the sequence. But uh, it's funny because it's one of her sister's favorite movie, and no lie. And it's I've got a weird nostalgia for it, too, because um, having worked at Universal and someone who had frequented Universal and ridden the ride for years, I feel like I know that more than I know the movie. But yeah, it was good to revisit it. Yeah, that's what I love about the whole idea of this show is is I probably haven't seen this movie in 15, 20 years and to go back and watch it and just I've forgotten pretty much the entire movie. So to be able to go back and watch it kind of with fresh eyes and, and have a blast with it, I, I thought it was a good time. So it's exactly what this is all about. Yeah, that I mean, I felt like once it did pick up, that last half is just like a full on action romp to use the one Emily called it as well. It is. That's exactly what it is. An action adventure romp. Even Jerry Goldsmith's score. He's having some fun with it and doing what everybody who composes a movie taking place in the desert with colonial people does is riff on Lawrence of Arabia. But uh, yeah, overall, it was uh, it was good to revisit. Yeah, I had a blast with it. So yeah, this is the first one uh, since we've been doing this that I really didn't have much of a memory of. So it was a little different than usual. Like movies like Footloose and Raging Bull and Lost Boys, I had a pretty strong recollection of. So it was it was fun to get one that was a little more blind for me, even though I'd seen it a handful of times. Indeed. Blind in that it Emotep stole your eyeballs. He did. He did. <laughs> But not my skin. Uh, we've, uh, not we've stolen we've stolen folks' ears for long enough. So thank you all for listening. Emily was late to the party, but we're glad she made it. This has been a presentation of the Paper Street Podcast and Paper Street Pictures. You can find uh, this podcast at paperstreetpodcast.com alongside the uh, Mothership Show. There's links to both Emily and all kinds of stuff on the episode page show notes there. So as always, appreciate you tuning in. I don't have a sign out for the show still. So I'm going to just say uh, till next time, gang. Thank you. Emotap. Chickens can't be trusted.